there is no typical homeless person. It's not just someone on the street with a dog on a string, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And a begging bowl. We're all aspiring to something. You've got to make something of yourself. People are paying to come and see a show. The show has to be great. That's non-negotiable. Everyone, in their own way, has this mountain to climb. It's a healing process to not be lost in our inadequacies of the real world and to be held in a project that is coalescing a dream and making it a reality. Today is hugely significant and quite terrifying. Just the fact that it's the beginning and that you want the process to begin in a positive way. You don't know who's going to come through the door and at this moment it's difficult to predict how the day will go or certainly how the, the next year will go. Has anyone told you they're definitely coming? Yeah, but that doesn't mean, you see, there are people, I'm expecting there to be, there's three or four kind of real, you know, definites, but real definites is that they, they were really definite a few days ago, but that doesn't mean, you know, a lot can happen over a weekend. So, just constantly aware that people's lives are changing very quickly, often, so things can, yeah, things can go up and down, which makes it difficult to plan anything. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm all right. Yeah. Gabriel, this is Joe. Hey, how are you, Joe? Hi, Dad. I'm good, mate. Good to meet you. Nice to If you do courses, it made me realise that I can do things even if I don't have a qualification. All I have to do is to follow my passion and my love and see what way it's going to take me. It's kind of like inspirational, like when you're trying to chase your dream and then you just find that icebreaker, you just have to hold on to something, you know what I mean? So the moment I found, I found like, yeah, I can get support from other people, I thought like, why not? We're from all walks of life, and what we all have in common is something somewhere has gone wrong and we've ended up suffering with homelessness or vulnerably housed. The Hidden Spire project, it just sort of creates a, a, a nice positive environment where creative ideas can come together and it's, um, it gives us something positive to work on. You don't have to know the whole story, you don't have to have thought about it, but the first thing that comes to mind today, you, I said this afternoon we're going to write a play. What would you write a play about? This place is about social mobility, maybe. It's very easy to get onto this. If you're a member here, you just put up your hand. It's like joining a team at school. We're all aspiring to something. I certainly am, to something that I could be something I could possibly be in the world outside. To me, that process is kind of like challenging and it's kind of like beautiful as well. You just come up with ideas like, with Rowan, she gives me the right to, to write any other things and I give her the right, like, yeah, they can do anything with that, you know what I mean? And it has to be action, comedy, romantic and realistic. Music, dancing, it has to be detailed and dangerous. 
And I think the idea of something being detailed and dangerous yeah. <laughs> is probably one that we can come back to in lots of ways. There's a lot of camaraderie, I would say, between the members, and um, you know, there's a, a lot of moral support. Yeah, and that is really important to make sure that you get enough rest in order. And I entered into a very wrong business deal, and I lost my income. I lost my uh, place to live. I had lost sort of everything which I cared about. So the, the idea of a play within a play. Since I've recently lost my mother and I've lost my dad, I'm, I'm alone in this city. I need, it. I need friends, I need all the friends I can get really. When you're alone like that, you realise it's just you against the world. You've got to make your own way. You've got to make something of yourself. I like this trip of travelling players and you like idea that he yeah. has got in his head today. Yeah. That's and a nice idea. Their own their own lives backstage are also part of the play. Yeah, okay. It's like a, um, a subplot. So you've got the kind of drama of people's real lives, the performers' lives, as well as the the on stage action of their of their oh. musical or comedy or farce. The, the, the quite contrasting ideas, aren't they? Yeah. And this is our first morning. Uh -huh. So that's nice, because we've got a really diverse... We have got a really If diverse everyone group. was on the same, then, then we'd be quite, getting a bit narrow-minded. Yeah. If that makes yeah. sense. Am I making sense? Well, you are I'm making sense. I'm so tired now, no. but I'm not. <laughs> you are making sense. Good. It's a very unique and diverse and, and at times odd mixture of people, myself very much included, who would sit in a room together and, and try and write a play. Well, my job is to hold this sign at various notable junctions in Oxford where throngs, vast throngs of people will pass by. Something will catch their eye on this poster. Usually Harry Potter, the Harry Potter sign, which seems to provoke some kind of Pavlovian reaction in uh, in, in young people, so I, I direct them to the shop and say it's just down there, Market Street. It's, it's quite a boring job, but I'm just happy to make money, really. You have to be someone who enjoys watching the world go by, all the interesting little peccadilloes about these people that pass by. People around about 20 years old, they all come out on the Saturday afternoon in their gangs. They whoop it up a bit and um, it just makes me feel a bit nostalgic for that, for when I was that age. It makes me feel a bit sad. But then the years pass, the springs, summers and winters. That's the course of life. I'm not that good at socialising, really. Do you like a relationship? Yeah, with someone. Have, yeah. You, have you ever been married? No. I've missed the boat, really. <laughs> I'm so much older. This, this, uh, I was ill for a long time with uh, chronic fatigue. I had chronic fatigue for about 10, 15 years. 
And then I was looking after my mother for another 10 years. I'm still young at heart. When you have experienced a lot of chaos and ups and downs and, 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 and you lose direction, the creativity within you, I feel, gives that a bit of purpose and direction again. Many of us are voiceless in many ways and it's finding that voice through a creative medium and that's why I came to Hidden Spies. Come in, come in. <laughs> we haven't started. Right, I'm going to close the door. Right, guys, hello. <laughs> um, we've been looking at kind of, um, I've been calling it vintage circus to be a bit poncy about it. But um, it, what we've been looking at is kind of old fashioned circus in Europe, in the European tradition, um, which basically is lots of extraordinary characters. All right. What have we talked about around circus and, and why people are in the circus or what circus life is like? I mean, I, you know, I've, I've always, like, you know, like a lot of people have that fantasy about running away with the circus. And I think especially it's attractive when you are someone that's kind of marginalised, you know, like, I think because the circus has always been somewhere where people um, end up perhaps when they don't fit into normal society you know, so yeah, they're it's, rejected, aren't they? Mm, so yeah. the circus is like their family. Yeah, exactly, and it always yeah. has seemed like a family. I mean, that's something that's really attracts people is that you're like you're you're in a family that really cares about you, and that you've got a place in it, and you've got a, a role, a function, and you know that whatever you might not be able to fit in in the outside world, like you'll always have a place in the circus. In some ways. Life is a circus, I think. What we're looking at is a, a play that brings together different characters, different characters that we created ourselves. And so this is going to be a, an interesting take on uh, what it means to, to, to be pulled out of society, but also have the boldness and, and, and ability to present yourself or a persona of yourself to an audience uh, in the form of a circus stage. These projects that we have and then these workshops that we have, they give a sense of self-worth, self-value, and it also gives a, a sense of community, connection, something that for many of us gets lost somewhere. It's something that is worthwhile cherishing. I like coming to Oxford. I, you know, the whole day here, I, I get up early, I get here early, so like by the, by the time I'm here, I've got a few hours to just to chill out, you know, go for a, go and get a, a, a cheese and tomato baguette, a couple of Earl Grey, and get hot chocolate and, and wait for the, uh, the group. Sean. No, you should, should write the bell. The dad. Yeah. And the relationship with the kids. Yeah. I've got this. And all the kids, they love my dad. Because you know he's the best. He's not bad. And when it's summer sorting in the sky, you know, it makes them whiz, it makes them high. And that's the reason they love my dad. Because when, when they're with my dad, they're not sad. Because he, he's one of the best that will ever be. He's one of the best you'll ever see. Yeah. yeah, that's nice, isn't it? Yeah, so I you've can, got... So you've got... I get a little chorus. Yeah. I get a little chorus going. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder um, what the conflict is, what the tension is, 
between Tommy and his dad. Because he's brilliant, he's great, all the kids love him, he does yeah. all this. But we've all got but we all have some we all have some little, little bit of tension. The little trickiness with our families or with our yeah. friends, don't we? There's always something that's a bit annoying or right. a bit a bit tricky. Right. And I just wonder, what does Tommy find annoying about Eric? Or what does he um, find difficult about him? He's so hell bent on on making Tommy into what he is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? There's a lot of pressure that, isn't it? And uh, from a very early age. Yeah. Let me think. Hmm, have a think. Yeah. So I like the idea of how the group works, that whatever we write in the group is something that Rowan, um, who is writing the play itself, uses as source material. So we are just creating all this stuff, and we don't really have much pressure, or we don't have a deadline. We just provide some raw material, and I like that idea. It's quite nice. It didn't matter to me that I don't know exactly how these people had come together yeah, or how their relationship is going to develop. At the beginning of the, the second term, somewhere around January, uh, a coach in the building had a word with me and said, there's this guy, the new member, um, he'd really like to do your course, but the thing is, he's got quite a lot of experience of writing and he's a bit worried, he doesn't want to come into your class and, and kind of that to be a problem for you, so he wanted me to check out with you. And I said, oh, that's fine, you know, it's fine. Well, I mean, he's got quite a lot of experience in writing. Like, he's the playwright. And I sort of thought, oh, you know, there's lots of playwrights. That's fine. And then as the conversation progressed and as I found out a little bit more, I realised that this was a published playwright who's two of his plays I have on my bookshelf <laughs> um, already, um, previous to meeting him. Um, and it started to feel a little bit different. But um, Doug came into yeah. the class. I did not reveal anything to the rest of the class, yeah. but it showed great restraint and consideration and, and compassion for people by not immediately declaring his experience and his knowledge, but by just following the instructions and joining in with the, the, the tasks and uh, giving <laughs> critical, you know, positive kind of critical feedback to people and being really, I think, I think genuinely really enjoying being part of a group. So I just wonder if you could take two, like... It's one of the, the things about the Hidden Spire experience is that you learn about people that you'd probably never otherwise have met. And not, not many things better in life than that, really, particularly in a creative atmosphere. The visual of the Christoph and Samuel being surrounded by the lines and their creepy lines. As someone who's worked in professional theatre all his adult life, I had to let a lot of stuff go. It was a challenge, but it was refreshing as well, um, because you have to find ways of talking about and thinking about what you're doing that aren't your normal way of doing it. One of the things that you'll know yourselves when you're sitting in a room and writing, you're writing different voices, but you, you can't hear them apart from inside your own head, which is quite a lonely thing well, to hear. Well, the crazy thing, yeah. Yeah. you talk about those kind of things with the doctors, they say like your man. They claim that I've got skills, so when I tell them, like, this is what I'm doing, they're like, if you're hearing voices, you got to go on medication. Mm. I told them it only, it only works for entertainment purposes. Yeah. They just don't understand yeah. it, you know what I mean? No, that must be very frustrating yeah. to, to experience that. I think that what is really important and what I can help with is to create this time here yeah. where we can write and we can use those characters and we can use those thoughts and those experiences yeah. to create something that is hopefully positive and that is, is useful. Something that I've felt uh, since becoming homeless is you lose your sense of belonging. It's very easy to go down the route of just feeling like you've been expelled from society. And that informed the play so much because everybody's got their own individual idea of, of what that feels like and why it's come about in their particular life. You know, there's no typical homeless person. That's why I hate it when the homeless are regarded as, you know, there are a million different types of homeless people, um, from families in B and Bs to the, the people you see sleeping rough on the streets to sofa surfers to, you know.
There are so many contradictions in Oxford. And maybe that's what I like about it, I don't know. You know it's town and gown. It's what some of us would consider obscene levels of wealth against people who've been made to pay for the financial crash, even though they weren't remotely responsible for it. What brought you to Oxford? Um, I came as a student in 1973 to study English at Worcester College, um, which was a bit of a culture shock to begin with, because I was born and bred on a council estate, went to grammar school, um, but uh, turned out to be three of the best years of my life. There, yeah, Worcester College. It was great, because it's got a lake, and I, I used to, I was, very keen fisherman, so I was fishing the lake. Uh, but I had to make myself scarce after 8.30 in case the provost caught me on his walk round. <laughs> walking, just walking round here, there's a memory on every pavement for me. Some, some very, very good ones and some less good ones. Four or five years ago, austerity and arts funding cuts, the BBC drama, the part where I worked for 20 years, um, it bit and the unthinkable happened. And uh, this is ironic because there you see this where someone's sleeping rough. Just uh, I couldn't afford to, to live really. Um, and when I eventually became homeless right at the beginning of 2017, um, it was, it does something very strange to you. That walking through town, you walk past millions of coffee shops and restaurants and things, and when you had a few bob, you probably didn't quite realise that you were taking in all the smells, all the aromas. But when you haven't got the money to go and buy a coffee or to go and get a sandwich or a sausage roll or whatever it is, um, it's a very stark reminder that in a real, very real sense, you don't belong anymore. Here I'll spread the plastic sheet and lay me down on flattened cardboard to entomb my abuse or ailing body, cold as any dying sun, under damp bedding from a long forgotten bedroom and refuse to dream. And as sleep performs its usual disappearing act, I see the diamond riches of the universe settle, sparkle and shine on my lifeless shape in the cold, dark winter and await the inevitable morning of the next day with ever open eyes. There was 22 weeks of writing a play classes and I think after about 15 to, 20, 15 to 17 weeks, somewhere around then, I said, I don't think we can, I can take any more information on. And I went away, I carried on running the class, um, but I, I went away and tried to put together a play that, that, that was based on those ideas, that used as much of the text that had been created um, as possible, so people's actual writing, actual words was in, were included, but that created a, a, a kind of some kind of narrative arc and a, and a story um, that would be uh, interesting and that would make sense to, to an audience. Tomorrow we have a reading of the script, 
So I'm just trying to get this draft of it to a, to a stage where I'm happy for that to happen. people or whether I'm just meant to sit here and wait. It's a bit like waiting for the head teacher or something. <laughs> oh, here are some people. Hello. Hello, love. How are you feeling? Shit. Come on. <laughs> right. It is actually still very early draft stage. It's all right. We've got yeah. loads of time. Yeah. We have. I know, I know. It doesn't, no. it, you know, it kind of starts and then it goes somewhere and then it sort of, sort of <laughs> does that. Oh So what we've got in the room now is we've got a bunch of people who have been writing for the last few months and contributing to the thing that we're about to hear. And then we've got a bunch of people who are going to be helping to take that piece of work and hopefully with the writers as well, uh, turn it into a show. So this is the first moment when those two groups of people have kind of met each other. So it's quite an important mm -hmm. moment but by the end of this month, we'll have a good idea of what the kind of story arc of the show is, if you like, and then we'll be able to start kind of refining and refining, and we can start bringing in the music and the design to support that during the rest of the year. We're backstage in a big top at Viva Vintage Circus. Christoph stands with his back to us, resplendent in full ringmaster regalia, arms raised, lit by a spotlight. We hear the applause of the circus audience that he stands in front of. It lasts for some time. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. It was quite a, quite a shock, the first read-through of the script. Seeing them all on the page, interacting, they had been brought to life. Maybe you should calm down. You're acting like a child. I'm acting like a child? Oh, just go away, Christoph. Go and chat up the audience and then drink yourself stupid and leave me alone. I don't want to look at you. I wanted people to feel that they owned the work, um, but I needed it to, to be coherent and cohesive in a way that was difficult to, to kind of imagine. So it was a bit like putting a jigsaw together and then, I don't know, and then trying to kind of edit the jigsaw to make it slightly clearer. And, and, and that was a a difficult job, a difficult to come back and share that work with people, reflecting their ideas, but with my my voice obviously being part of that, and I, I found that very very worrying. that it's an amalgamation of lots of different people's ideas and writing styles. It's really beautifully done, kind of melded together there, Rowan. Yeah. Did anyone recognise their own voices in there? I don't know who did what in this process. I've got no idea. I wrote uh, about Eric and Sophie. Oh, OK. So I was reading Eric's part today. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I really yeah. like that. It's great. Yeah, it's quite good, yeah. 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 It's really good. It's good to see that everyone's uh, character Deve is developed uh, uh, interconnects. Especially the lions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were Neil's lions. Are they your lions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're great. <laughs> I can really feel that bubbling tension this time as well. Mm. Yeah. Had, you know, these whispered messages going around, but no one quite knows what's going on. That was really. I think it sort of has that mystery play quality of, <laughs> of being funny and uh, engaging and episodic, but um, sort of ramshackle and thrown together and everything's happening live on stage, but also having so much to say about what's happening for everybody at the moment. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. 
So it's going to be an interesting transition from where we are now into a, a, a more broader, more broader scope for the for the project. creating the sun to go across the top of the eight door. just turned up for one of the rehearsal things with the idea that I was just going to help set up the microphones because I hadn't want, wanted to get involved in the performance side of things and um, as it happened uh, gentle persuasion from Rowan <laughs> got me involved. <laughs> yeah, I was really content to play any character. I just wanted to be in the thing. I didn't, I wasn't really concerned who I played, but I was, since I created that character myself, maybe I had an inside track on his personality. They're coming from all sorts of different physical lives and journeys. So for me, the warm up is about the moment where we let that go. I feel like it's like the transition between life and the world in the theatre. I worked with various homeless projects in Oxford for about five years in total. So I suppose I've got from both sides of the coin and then when, when things went a bit pear-shaped for me, I was homeless for six months and I was sleeping on um, park benches and, 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 you know, and behind the ice rink and, and stuff like that. And then for a little while I was sofa surfing. So I think just the fact I was running to be housed and I needed support, that's what made me reconnect back to the crisis. The movement work that we did is brilliant for bonding, trust, um, and just getting rid of your inhibitions. Let your hips go forward. That's a bit skanky. <laughs> so it was a gentle pushing together of, of we're all in the same boat. We all need to join in our journey together. And the journey starts now. And as a group, we become one. Ready to go, chaps? Absolutely, <laughs> I've got a long standing back problem. So, Emma, the movement director, was very careful always. Whatever she said, she'd write now, why don't you do this? And she'd say, and Doug, um, you just do what you can. <laughs> and I'd say, yeah, I'm doing my best. Oh, ouch. And then finally, the day when I could actually touch my toes was, I. I well, no physio that I've been to has ever managed to get me to do that. And it was a huge confidence builder. And that then fed into the, the, the actual spoken word. Grab your scripts. AJ and Cody, 
You've probably got time to do some line running together, if that would be a good use of time. Mm -hmm. Line yeah. The thought of learning dialogue and reciting dialogue on stage was something that was totally terrifying to me and, and, and took me completely out of my comfort zone. I just didn't think I could, I could do it. So, might as well just start off with the start, like the first thing we do yeah. together. Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. We're so lucky. So lucky to have him. Our very, very own son. I love being his mum. He takes after his dad. My own little life. Just me thinking, I will not be able to do this. I, I'm going to let people down and let myself down. Like, it just seemed too, too big. Yeah. Just, just beyond the realms of possibility for me. Every day. <laughs> Every day, you know, it's, it's really difficult. You're going to have to cut this. <laughs> it was repetition, repetition. It was all consuming. It did completely take over my life. Not all of you are on stage, but I'd love you all to contribute to the da da da. If you can't quite remember, it goes like this. Da da da. It was just new ground, constantly. People's roles changed, people were stepping up, especially in the first week of getting to know each other and, and realising that we've got a production journey to go on. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> There's all the social needs that, uh, that we have normally anyway, but with personalities with vastly different needs. So it's a real test. Um, all right, should we go from the top of scene? I need to be thinking about how every single thing we do in the rehearsal room is having an effect on everyone in that room. It's not just, oh, will we get this play on? Um, is it going to be good enough? It's actually much more um, deep. Um, I love what you're doing. I definitely don't want you to pretend to shoot the audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not shooting. OK, well, whatever you're doing, it, it's quite scary. Scary. Yeah, it's like looking like at it. the end, get scared of it, you know. Like all this, we were dancing around. One more time, then we'll break it Yes, Yes. Woo! Yes. 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 I get to be nasty to Christoph. So it feels like at times the whole show is, is shored up and there's a few crampons in the mudslide. We had a, um, a, a phrase which was, uh, we, it was really nice, which we, we stick together like sawdust. And that was, that was so true, because a, a slight breeze could, could send, send the structure um, into different directions. You're, Pierre, you're on your feet. She just got serious, you Listen, I'm sure if we all sit down, have a moment to cool off, we can sort this out. You just don't get it, do you? We're trying to get it. Well, help us to understand. But you... So Pierre comes in, um, I want you to hold it with reverence rather than like that. So, and, and you present it to him and, and your thought is, yeah, I need my crown for this. Cool. I'm going to put it on. We've been constantly rehearsed over and over and over and over again. The same scenes to get it exact, exactly right over and over again. Just come in, Martin, come in. Keep going, everyone, with their lives. Help us to understand. If I was a famous actor on, on a Hollywood set, I might throw a tantrum <laughs> there. I'm not. So. Oh, 
Oh, the canal is beautiful, beautiful. To be honest, I, um, I did think about sleeping rough here, but it's actually busier than you would imagine. There's a lot, a lot of traffic and um, yeah, there was, uh, there was prostitution and drug dealing. So it's very picturesque, but I think that that's in a way a, a perfect illustration of, of, of Oxford in a way, how picturesque and idyllic it looks and the whole dream inspires thing. But there's a, there's a quite a seedy underbelly really. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, Oxford's a funny, funny place. I feel lucky, I feel blessed that I've got a little flat, but, and I'm hanging on to that for dear life, really, because there's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get extra work and there's benefit cuts and all kinds of stuff. And I always, to be honest, I mean, you probably know the expression there, but for the grace of God go I. Honestly, I see people out on the streets and I, I just feel like that could easily happen again. I think what, what was shocking to me was how quickly I became homeless. The, you know, um, marriage breakup, drinking too much, mental health, I was self-medicating. And I don't think I, I don't think I realized I actually had a mental health problem. And just how quickly things spiraled out of control. I lost jobs. Um, and then, yeah, from one day having a, a, a nice home to, yeah, sleeping rough. So this was the old post office and when I was working, I was working for the Salvation Army Homeless Project and I mean all that was the old post office isn't it? and when they closed it down there were, we used to go in there and there were lots and lots of people sleeping rough in there huge building now i guess they're very expensive homes i've no idea how much they are <laughs> but that was when i was a worker not when i was homeless but when we used to do the um tea run and blanket run this is one of the pla this is one of the places we used to go to it was kind of weird though people who used who i used to do support work for, for my clients and I was sleeping next to them on the streets. <laughs> that, that felt like a fall from grace. I actually haven't been back here, around here since, you know, since I got a place. Filming again, mate. How you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, I'm alright. Cool. <laughs> All eyes on me, mate. Two pack. <laughs> so this is this was one of my spots. I would chuck what I'd have to do sometimes, I'd have to clear away stinging nettles, obviously. But I'd find a spot like this, this spot, spot I slept at a couple of times, chuck my stuff over, stick my blanket on, jump over, and I felt relatively safe there, you know, just because it was a bit behind a fence. So this to me would be a good spot once I got rid of the stinging nettles and stuff. And just behind there, that's, yeah, this is me bit further up sometimes on the other side as well I often think if I was homeless I'm, I still sometimes look and think mm, that would be a good slot I never want to be homeless again and I don't think I ever will be and, you know I'm very positive about that but um, mm, yeah it feels weird <laughs> Filling your lungs. 
Clear word, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. One, two, three. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Hood, Hood. You want a big fat, big fat operatic? Robin Hood! By all means, hands. Everyone, in their own way, has this mountain to climb and some people get to the peak <laughs> earlier than others and that peak could represent some kind of huge personal mission or challenge or dark place that they have to get to before they're ready to put the show on. Drink your two of alcohol and drink your two of alcohol. Theatre is always a tough process, always. It's, it is about being vulnerable, but this project is the one that I come out of feeling like it has a very particular role and a worthwhile one. OK, have a very good evening, everybody. Don't forget, have a look at your scripts. Give yourself some time to learn your words, but rest and look after yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Are you going to get some rest tonight? I don't know about that. I find it difficult to sleep at times, innit? You know, when your mind is kind of like going, it's difficult to put yourself to bed, you know? You can learn from the teachers as well. They tell you what to do. It might piss me off at times, but, you know, I have to be like, easy boy, easy boy, before you start firing the guns. But that challenge, yeah, to go beyond the capabilities, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's something dope, you know. Yeah. It was a really nice day. Thank I got, yeah, it's dope, yeah, yeah. It was great. Enjoy, yeah? Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, yeah, <laughs> enjoy, yeah? Enjoy, enjoy. enjoy. Yeah. have a good evening. Ah, beautiful. Same thing. Ready or not, <laughs> here we come. You're gonna find us at Alton Fire Station. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Young people, <laughs> scary. With their, with their rap music and their low slung trail. How are you today? Yeah, actually. <laughs> it's going to be great. Yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> Lots of yeah, yeah. Come on, lovely. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this, this is my script, yeah? I was looking for this probably up until 9 o'clock last night. You know, not important, just a day before the first show. Who had it? <laughs> Miss Jones. I <laughs> I uh, picked the wrong word. <laughs> we don't need scripts at this stage. We're fine. Yeah, we're fine. Yeah. We're professionals. Oh. Yeah. For the first night, I get quite excited that we're throwing the dice. We can't do any more. It is going to be what it will be. Um, let's let's go. <laughs> Knowing that there's audience out there and whatever's happened up to this point we have to put a show on and that kicks in, that adrenaline, that excitement. Ladies and gentlemen of the Sawdust Company, this is your half hour core. Yeah. You are due on stage in full makeup and costume for warm up and preset in 30 minutes. Whoop, whoop. How are you doing? Are you ready? As you'll ever be. There's so much to remember. There's so much to remember. It's long getting the words right. Yeah, yeah. It's like dry up. I tend to dry up in there. I'm getting all the cues. 
Got a little torch backstage. Oh dear. It's got to that moment where I've gone, there's nothing else I can do. <laughs> That's that, and we'll see how it goes. It's so hard to prepare for an audience when they're not there. Ladies and gentlemen of the Sawdust Company, Here we this go. is your five you have five minutes until you are due on stage in full makeup and costume, ready for the company warm-up and into preset. You can't beat that feeling of having climbed that mountain, of trying to put on a show together with a bunch of other eccentric, creative, difficult people. It gives you such a buzz and it's such a positive feeling. What are we doing here? I mean, really? What are we doing here? It was a great experience that we had with full houses, really appreciative audiences, and, um, and it was absolutely great to see people who'd never done it before experiencing that. It was, yeah, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Doing this, I feel, has been such a valuable and positive experience because I honestly did not believe I could do this. Without sounding a bit over the top, I feel more rounded, more positive, um, just way more confident. I feel I can overcome my demons. Well, um, I felt nourished. I've always wanted my own little family. It's so nice to work in a local community of people where you know, you know they all live in the same city and you can maybe see them in the street from time to time. Opened and hungry without any family Run to the circus in search of humanity It's just obvious that uh, everybody is reliant on everybody else, but everybody can be reliant on everybody else because everybody else is there to support everybody else without question. It's you just walk away, uh, sort of feeling uh, so um, uh, sort of loved, really. This project breaks your heart and then reforms it with added extras. So you do feel rejuvenated, hopeful and rewarded. The first night and the last night we were seized by a kind of euphoria a frenzy of excitement. 
and um, anticipation, fulfillment, almost reached fever pitch. The interaction, the, the um, sense of camaraderie. <laughs> well done. Bravo. Bring it. <laughs> well done. Oh. You were outstanding. Oh, well done. <laughs> very well done. Thank you very much for all your work. If you're part of something successful and positive and nurturing, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> we did it! Yay! Come on, lions! Thank you. Yes, mama. Big things up one day. Hey, can't see the crown. Something special, you know, <laughs> relating to the to the show. Something makes it more beautiful. You get the energy just to be the king of the one of the theatre. You know, king of the. Oh, you get the heck out of it. For me, it's been a remarkable journey up, down, sideways, <laughs> always. Um, but it's just great to have found myself landing back in the theatre which is where I sort of belong and where I'm happiest. Did you, did you kiss the snake? Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I had to, I had to, yeah, I had to, mate. It was, I was gonna, I'm going to miss it anyway, you know. Yeah. Until I get to another stage, I don't know what's going to happen, but you got to give respect to everything, you know what I mean? Yeah. The team and everyone, mate, they're just amazing, mate. Just kind of, some words that just, you never have words in your mouth, yeah? yeah. But maybe the so the only way on the Sunday morning it could go was down. Uh, I went to church that Sunday morning and I paid my devotions to God. And I thanked him for how well it went. Yeah.